Welcome to the Fall 2020 Ladies Big Book Study Recording Series. My name is Kimberly and I am a recovered alcoholic. I am the facilitator of a tri-weekly big book study for ladies only and we record each session so we can share the knowledge along with you. What we do is we read the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous line by line. We pause on each page and have discussion time to share our experience, our strength, and our hope on each page. You are more than welcome to follow along in this series and do the work of the steps of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you do need support at any time, please reach out to me in the Contact Us area of my YouTube channel and we're happy to provide you with support. The online recordings are open to men and women. Do not be discouraged, gentlemen. Our ladies' point of view may offer you a different perspective. So welcome. I hope you enjoy. We are continuing on in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are on page 53. We are finishing up We Agnostics today and it goes like this. That was natural, but let us think a little more closely. Without knowing it, had we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith? For did not we believe in our own reasoning? Did we not have confidence in our ability to think? What was that but a sort of faith? Yes, we had been faithful, abjectly faithful to the God of reason. So in one way or another, we discovered that faith had been involved all the time. We found, too, that we had been worshippers. What a state of mental goose flesh that used to bring on. Had we not variously worshipped people, sentiment, things, money, and ourselves? And then, with a better motive, had we not worshipfully beheld the sunset, the sea, or a flower? Who of us had not loved something or somebody? How much did these feelings, these loves, these worships have to do with pure reason? Little or nothing, we saw at last. Were not these things the tissue out of which our lives were constructed? Did not these feelings, after all, determine the course of our existence? It was impossible to say we had no capacity for faith or love, or worship. In one form or another, we had been living by faith and little else. Imagine life without faith. Were nothing left but pure reason, it wouldn't be life. But we believed in life. Of course we did. We could not prove life in the sense that you could prove a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. Yet, there it is. Could we still say the whole thing was nothing but a mass of electrons created out of nothing, meaning nothing, whirling on to a destiny of nothingness? Of course we couldn't. The electrons themselves seemed more intelligent than that, at least so the chemist said. Hence, we saw that reason isn't everything. Neither is reason, as most of us use it, entirely dependable, though it emanate from our best minds. What about the men who proved that man could never fly? I really like this page and it makes me think back to Bill's story. Um, when we were reading in Bill's story previous, you know, there were certain points in his story where you would think he would have given up. You know, when the market crashed and there was men jumping from the towers um, of high finance and, and Bill just said, well, tomorrow's a new day. I'm going to go to the bar. You know, there I see that little glimpse that he had some sort of faith. It was more faith in himself and his ability to overcome these things than it was in a, in a higher power, but he had faith. So faith was there all along. It was just in himself and not an outside entity. And, and I can relate to that, right? I thought myself will. And, you know, we look at um, our friend Fred and Jim in the previous chapters, and they both thought that this self will and they had faith in themselves as well. And so that's something for me that really hit home. It's like I always thought that I could overcome it. But it was just there was always that little bit that there wasn't enough of it to get me there. 
You know, I had all my affirmations, I had all my self-help books, and you know, if only I did this or that or this or that, but there just wasn't enough power there for me to do it myself. Um, and then that, that, that paragraph of that mental goose flex of worshiping, you know, guilty. I worshipped celebrities. I worshipped famous people that weren't celebrities, um, you know, doctorates and philosophers. Um, I worshipped um, people who were in the self-help business, you know, Tony Robbins. I'm going to, you know, be, be bow down to him. Oprah Winfrey, you know, she was a goddess in my eyes. Um, you know, people that had money, people had belongings. And it was all of these outside things that I wanted and I worshipped and I strived for, um, which got me here. Um, you know, it didn't, it didn't help anything. And I love that they used the tissue out of which our lives were constructed. I love the wording there, um, the tissue. And if I think of tissue paper, it's very thin. It's very fragile. You know, and that tissue rips easily and falls apart easily. And that was my life. My life fell apart so easily when I worshipped things. Um, you know, even when I had fancy things, it was just a facade and it fell apart so easily. Um, so I love that wording of the tissue because um, it makes me think of tissue paper. And then it goes on to talk more about faith and about the electrons and, and the, the, the Wright brothers who flew. And we discussed them in detail last time. Anyone else wish to share on this page or on faith or on how you had faith? Nope. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, Della. Uh, Della, recovering alcoholic. I can see that now. <laughs> um, you know, even though I'm not an agnostic, a lot of this just, it just stirs that confirmation. You know, there's so many thought-provoking things in here that it just confirms everything. And so I think... Even if you're not an agnostic, I think this chapter is so important. Thanks, Kim. Absolutely. I'm. Um, you know, I, I was not an atheist or an agnostic. I was a not liking the idea person, which falls somewhere in between. And yeah, it's like this. Just it brings it to life more and more. And every time I read it, I, I, it just reaffirms that faith that I have. Absolutely. Lots of nodding heads. Okay, let's keep going. Page 55. Yet we had been seeing another kind of flight, a spiritual liberation from this world. People who rose above their problems. They said God made these things possible, and we only smiled. We had seen spiritual release, but liked to tell ourselves it wasn't true. Actually, we were fooling ourselves. For deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or other it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. We finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup, just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there, and he was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It was so with us. I'm going to stop there because I want to talk about that and then discuss it and tell you a story. Um, so in here, you know, we see this spiritual liberation. We see people come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. We see the light come on, the darkness start to disappear. And, and we hear them say, I owe this all to Alcoholics Anonymous and God. And we do. We smile and say, oh, yeah, okay. Um, and I get that a lot myself personally where uh, people can't relate. 
so they're they look at me and they're like well she's got it all together like I could never be like her she's got an upper edge or an advantage because of who she is they don't see that I used to be the the strung out down and out drunk mom that couldn't get her kids to school who let the kids sit in front of the tv while I tried to sleep all morning you know so we have to keep that person close because I was. I was just like you. I didn't have any confidence. I had a million insecurities and fears. But because I've welcomed God into my life and adopted this program into my life, I've had this change come about me. And I mean, I thought you all were liars when I got here. 20 years sober, no way. You're a liar. You must have had a drink in there somewhere. But now I know you're telling me the truth. Um, and then we, I love these two paragraphs and I really want to talk about them. And it's that, you know, that we all have that fundamental idea of God. And, and you know, the boys call it um, God's fingerprints. I like to call it God's puzzle pieces. Um, and when I read these two paragraphs, it's like, you know, we finally saw that faith in some kind of God was part of our makeup. And if we looked fearlessly, he was there. I can look back on the past 22 years of my life and see how he was there the entire time. It was myself who blocked him out. It was my calamity. It was my worship. It was my pomp. It was my bullshit to say nothing less that blocked him out. So when I was in my early 20s, my daughter Madison, who's my older daughter, was, was little and I worked in the bars at night and I had a nanny. And I, I manipulated and used this nanny. And so on the weekends, my daughter would stay at the nanny's house so that I could work in the bar. Working in the bar meant partying until 7 in the morning after work. Every Sunday morning, this nanny, Auntie M, would take my daughter to church. Every Saturday, Sunday morning. So one Sunday morning, you know, I had done a little bit too much and I wasn't feeling very hot, but they invited me to church with them and I felt obligated. And so I went and I went into that church and I swear the pastor was looking right at me. It was the, directed at me the entire sermon. Like I was like, oh my God, I meant to be here. But what did I do? I left, just like Bill left the cathedral in England. I left, and I never thought anything about it. I went on with my life for the next 14 years, and my kids started to play baseball. And this is at the lowest point of my life. When I'm in my marriage, it's super dark. My addiction is at its highest, and there was moms at baseball that were churchgoers. The coach was a churchgoer. And unbeknownst to me, they were praying for me. So when I came into recovery, I went on a trip down to Phoenix. And, and on that trip, I had just found God. I was just about two years sober at that time. And I wanted to find God. And I, I went about, and that trip, I was going to find God. Because at these conferences I went to, there was a lot of Southern girls and they they were the Jesus freaks, we used to call them. And they had a prayer breakfast. And my intent was to go and get something. And you hear this in the rooms. It's not what you can take. It's what you can give. So I ended up giving the entire five-day conference. At the prayer breakfast, which my intent was to take from, everybody wanted to hear my story. Over and over and over again. Oh, I want to hear your story. I want to hear your story. And at the end of the conference, I was like, I wanted to come down here and I wanted to get this and I wanted to find out more about God and I wanted this and that and the other thing. And all anybody wanted was to hear my story. Very selfish and self-centered of me. So I didn't go to the end party. I said, I have to charge my phone. My phone had no battery that whole weekend. And normally I always have a battery. So I plugged in my phone in my hotel room. And then I thought, I need to get a juice. So I walked to go find a Jamba Juice. And I forgot my cell phone. And if anybody knows me, they know this thing is never away from me. Ever. I run my life, my business is everything off my phone. Halfway to the Jamba Juice, I went, 
oh, I forgot my phone. And something told me, just keep going. It's going to be okay. And it was like, you know, normal, I would walk back to get my cell phone, but I didn't. So I get to the juice place, and this is a health conference I'm at. So the juice place is busy, and they're like, it's going to be half an hour for your juice. And I'm like, half an hour for my juice? Oh, my God. Like, no. Normally, I would leave. I'm not waiting half an hour. Plus, I don't have my phone. That's not happening. And I just, I forced myself to sit down. And I literally was reading the signs on the wall. And I was wearing a shirt that said, this girl runs on Jesus and juice, right? And a gentleman turned to me, and he says, Jesus, hey? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, what do you know about Jesus? And I just unloaded. I said, well, actually, I'm here and I just found God and I'm in recovery and I wanted to know more and I wanted to have a closer relationship with God and I came down here and all anybody wanted to know was my story and I didn't get anything out of it. And him and I had a 30-minute conversation about God. He was the local youth pastor. Here I had been looking to take, not realizing that I need to give to receive, and after giving, I received. So I come back to Vancouver and I'm at baseball and I sit down at the bench with one of the moms and I was telling her this story about my trip because she said, how was your trip? And I said, oh, la la la. And I said, I had this amazing conversation with this pastor and it changed my life. And she said, Kim, are you looking for a church? And I said, yeah, I am. And she's like, you should come check out my church. And I was like, yeah. And so I'm like, when is it? She's like, Sunday. It's in Pitt Meadows. It's close to you. And I'm like, great. I'll be there. So she calls on the Friday and says, do you still come to church on Sunday? I said, yes. And I went there and I met the door greeter and I loved it. I felt great. And then it says, this is Coastal Church. And I'm like, Jen, is this the same Coastal Church as the one downtown? She goes, yeah, it is. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so weird. I went to that church when I was in active addiction and I had this life-changing moment and I've been thinking about that church ever since. I was back in the same church. So a week later, she's like, calls, are you coming to church again on Sunday? And I said, yes, I am. I, she says, I'm not going to be there, but you go. My mom, Cheryl, will be there and she'll sit with you. I said, okay. So I get to church on Sunday morning and I talk to the greeter and he re remembered me and I was like, that's weird. He remembered me of all these people. And I'm like, yeah, Jen said I'm supposed to meet her, her mom. And he goes, yep, yep, Pastor Cheryl, she's down front. Jen's parents were the pastors that founded the church. The same pastor who had spoke the day I was there in my 20s. Turns out when I went downtown, my baseball coach and his wife, who had been praying for me for five years, are the ushers at the downtown location of the church. God had been trying to get me to that church since I was in my early 20s. So this paragraph speaks to me of these experiences. When we look, God has been there with us the entire time. And it's only us that blocks him out. I have since gotten baptized at that church. Summer goes to that church. Um, a ton of people from the recovery community in Vancouver go to that church. And the message at that church is parallel to the message I hear in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I frequently plagiarize um, Pastor Dave's sermons in my AA meetings because I can mix and mingle them. Um, so when I read this, you know, we found the great reality deep down within us was that he's been there that entire time. You know, and the boys call it the fingerprints of God. I call it God's puzzle pieces because it was like once I got out of the way, the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. You know, to hear Coach Dave's wife, Annalisa, say, I've been praying for you for seven years when I walked into church, you know. And I said, this is amazing. Like, every time I come here, I hear what I need to hear. And she goes, the amazing thing is, is 300 other people can say that too. And that's the same thing with the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We can come in. We can all hear just the same message, but get a different thing out of it that we need to hear at that time. And that's what I get out of this book. So that was my story about that paragraph. And I know it was a little long, but I love that story. Anne-Marie. Hi, I'm Anne-Marie. I'm an alcoholic. 
I have always felt like I'm, I'm not religious. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lapsed Catholic. But every time I walk into any church, Catholic, Protestant, Methodist, whatever, I have this feeling of coming home that's mixed in with, the, with feelings of awe and peace and quiet. I don't know if you believe in the flow lines in, in the earth. They're lines of power that flow around the planet. And somehow, churches are built on them. And I believe in that. Because I can't even walk into a chapel without just ooh, calming down. It's almost like zen, you know? And, and talk about the power of prayer. I, I, I was still drinking. I had my niece and, and her family over for... for something or other, I don't remember what. And as they were about to leave, my niece looked at me, she said, you know, your sister worries about you drinking a lot. I said, well, you know, tough shit, <laughs> you know, tough shit. She said, well, my, my, my niece is Baptist Pentecostal. Um, she said, can I ask my prayer group to pray for you? I said, sure, go ahead, what do I care? It was less than a year I was sober after that. So I believe in it too. Power of prayer. I really do. Thank you, Kimberly. You're, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lois. Oh. Okay. And I'll start my video. There I am. <laughs> <laughs> I had a similar experience. Probably not quite as profound as yours, but I had a really good friend and and she was very um born again christian and um i lost contact with her when my husband was sick and um once he passed away um i was i was back in touch with her and she had been praying for me and and my husband and i kept saying to her i'm not interested in organized religion and, and I kept going over to her house because I was very lonely. I had lost my husband. He had died of Guillain-Barre, which took him within a month of when we found out about it. And um, I kept going over to her house because I, I didn't want to be at my house by myself. And I, she finally got me to go to church. And don't you know the sermon that the, the pastor was talking about was the woman at the well. And like you said, I felt like he was looking right at me and, and talking right to me. And there are no coincidences, you know, they're, they're God shots. That's what I call them. And, and, and God comes to us when we're ready and, and when we're open to the, the, the pressing of that Holy Spirit. So I, I truly believe that this was all a divine thing. You know, that he was reading William James. He was in the um, the uh, the first group, which was very Christian. But yet he drew from it and brought it so that it could be open to everyone, which is the reason we've been around for so long and that we're, or we've grown so much. Um, it's your concept of God. Whether whether you believe in God or not is, is your opinion, but just to know that there's a higher power, that there's something outside ourselves that is actually um, has created this and, and is, is got a plan through the whole thing. So I really, I really believe that. And thank you. Thank you, Lois. Yvette! That alcoholic. Thank you, Kim. Good to see everybody. And wow. Oh my gosh. I totally got chills in a good way. Wow. Yeah. And relating to what everyone said about, um, you know, I was thinking of like on still on the range of God shots and hindsight's 2020 and, and just experience strength and hope really quick. Um, yeah. When I was newly sober, I was, I cried the first 90 days 
And I know now through doing the work, people are like, what? And I'm like, I couldn't even make a sentence. Newcomers, I'm like, you're doing so well. But um, so I remember somewhere around 90 days, like the fog was kind of clearing, kind of. Um, and we held hands. It was my home meeting in Teston, California. It was above a bank. Like, I don't know how 80 or so people fit in that room, but really big meeting and we're holding hands. And then they got to the part where we moment of silence for the alcoholic who still suffers. And for some reason it struck me in the heart and I was like, thank you. Oh my gosh, you guys have been praying for me this whole time. And I made it here and it was incredible. And so we hear what we hear. It takes what it takes. And wow. You know, and I have since evolved, um, similar to what Kim said, but it's a daily adventure. And I'm glad it's a spiritual, not religious program, because initially I had a lot of, like we do, you know, stuff. So I'm glad that people were gentle with me and let me kind of figure it out for myself. But yeah, my first um, higher power was G-O-D, group of drunk. So thanks to all of you guys. It's an ever-ending journey. We don't graduate, and thank God. Love you guys. Thank you so much. I had a, I have a sponsee that is struggling to get this for a long time. And we were at a meeting and she would come to meetings drunk every time. She still does. She hasn't quite found our solution yet. And uh, at one meeting she sat there and she goes, that's me. I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> She's like, okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? If you don't know where your mute button or the hand up, you can just unmute. Linda, you trying to unmute? You can unmute. Um, hi, everyone. Like, I still struggle with this, you know, as, as long as I've been here. You know, like I have, like they say, you know, in every man, woman, and child, there's a fundamental belief of God. But yet, you know, I don't seem to know how to nurture that relationship with that, that power. You know, like I ask for help in the morning and then I go about my day, you know, as if God doesn't exist. So, you know, I really need some direction on how to do that. Well, absolutely. And it's it's a bit of a two-way relationship we have to remember. So the thing I like to, 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 to hold close to heart is it says keep God close and do his work well. So when I'm asking for help from him, what am I doing in return? Because it's a two-way relationship. So for me, I do a lot of service. I take a lot of phone calls from newcomers. I sponsor other women. Um, I try to be kind and loving to all humans. Um, you know, and that's kind of loving God's kids. And in return, God takes care of me. Um, so I have to kind of think of it as a two-way relationship. I can't just always be asking and taking from God. Like in my story where I was in Phoenix and I'm like, I'm looking for something. I want something. Why are all these people asking for me for my story? I felt like they were draining my bucket. Well, I have to give in order to receive. And so he had a beautiful gift for me when I got past myself. Um, so I always find, you know, walking with love and kindness to everyone and being patient and courteous to people that maybe are still sick and suffering and then helping others. And that's kind of like the currency to get the prayers to come true in in a weird way to put it. Um, but we have to give to receive. Yeah. So, so it might be something in the meditation where you sit and say, okay, what am I giving forward to God in order to receive his blessings? Carrie. Hi, I'm Carrie. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't know if I unmuted. Um, um, I've been like Linda also just struggling with the whole higher power concept. And, uh, what my sponsor tells me is just pray every day, meditate every day. And at some point it, it, you'll be open, you know, you'll, you'll completely open yourself. Um, but you gotta listen also. Um, so I, I, that's what I'm kind of doing because I'm, you know, I only have 12 days today. I'm a chronic relapser. Um, and just following her instructions by doing that daily, um, like I said earlier today, the everything my head is just so noisy, you know, um, with all the 
chaos and stuff that goes on in my head. Um, and that's, I guess it's kind of helping because I'm not, um, a lot of things have been happening in my life where I'm not reacting like I would normally, like kind of freak out and, you know, um, but, um, so I, I'm hoping that's giving me, uh, you know, closer to my higher power, but that's what I've been doing. You might, you know, try to put that at maybe in a daily routine or something. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if it works or not, but that's what I'm doing and it, I, I'm, a little more calmer it seems um and hopefully i'm getting that closer contact with you know my higher power i'm hoping it works <laughs> absolutely and and doing that step four and five gets rid of a lot of the chaos i'm telling you right now prayer gets well, i've been on i've been on step one for three months <laughs> yeah you gotta move that you gotta move that along you gotta move that along because honestly the longer you stay stuck, the less you're going to get ahead. Because if you're just sitting there in step one, not sure if you're an alcoholic, you need to make, you need to figure it out. Are you an alcoholic? Yeah. Can you stop drinking when you want to stop? No? Okay, well, let's move on. Can you believe in a power greater than yourself? Yeah, I'm willing to believe. Okay, let's move on. Can you listen yeah. to your barometer? Like, really, listening to God is a barometer. Does it feel gross or does it feel like a good thing to do? You know, if I'm doing things that make me feel like, mm, it's probably not God's will. It's probably my will. If I'm doing yeah. things that seem to be loving and kind and in spirit for everyone, not selfish and directed only for me, then I'm then I'm doing God's will. If I'm willing to be in God's will, you're past step three. Move on to step four. Okay. Like that's okay. basic. Yeah. Like that's that's one, two, three in what two minutes? Yeah. I just, yeah, she has, she wants me, she's very thorough and she wants me, I guess, to get a really good if you're understanding a, of, honestly, of my disease. Honestly, she'll probably hate me for saying this. If you're a chronic relapser, you don't got time to be thorough. You need to get the basics and then you can get it mastered later. Okay. Right? Okay. Like when I, when I pick up a pair of scissors, I don't cut straight the first time. But I learn how to cut safely. I learn how to pass them safely. Then yeah. I practice cutting and my cutting gets straighter. Same thing with it. If you're a chronic relapser, get the basics and study it later and get it perfected later. Because it's not going to help you. So you can move on through the steps if you do relapse. Then. Fuck yeah. Oh, okay. I, are you, I, I, are I you an alcoholic? Really understand. Are you an alcoholic? Yeah. Are you sure you're an alcoholic? Do you have any doubt in your mind that your life is a disaster when you drink? You can't stop <laughs> when you want to stop and you drink too no much. No doubt at all. <laughs> okay, you got step one. Step two, are you willing to believe in a power? Doesn't matter what it is. Any power. Yes. Okay, absolutely. step two, done. Step three, are you willing to try to do God's will in all of your affairs? Absolutely. There you go. Do step four. We're starting next week. Okay. Thank you. Come back on Friday. <laughs> Irene's going to fall off her chair because I did the same thing to her. <laughs> Don't stay stuck. <laughs> You're going to keep relapsing. Like, swear to God. You can perfect it later. Like, we study this every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You can study it and get it get more later, but you got to get it down and just move on because if you don't do step four, you're going to keep relapsing. Dead serious. Cleaning the house then. <laughs> Clean your house. If you're willing to believe and 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 you're willing to try this, move on get this shit done we start it we're we're done this chapter we start how it works on friday all right ladies so don't tell anybody you can't do one two three in less than five minutes all right <laughs> let's go uh 55 halfway down we can only clear the ground a bit if our testimony helps sweep away prejudice enables you to think honestly encourages you to search diligently within yourself, then, if you wish, you can join us on the Bride Highway. With this attitude, you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. Breaking it down, we can only clear the ground a bit. We're here to break away your prejudice. Then, if you can break down your prejudice, honestly, encouragingly, encourages you to search diligently, join us. All you need to do, I'm willing to set aside the prejudice. I'm willing to give it a shot. And what happens? The consciousness of your belief is sure to come. 
doesn't say maybe. It says is sure to come. So all you got to do is just be willing to try this. If you try this and you're willing and open-minded and you honestly put in a good effort, it'll happen. And the more you practice it, the more it happens. In this book, you will read the experience of a man who thought he was an atheist. His story is so interesting that some of it should be told now. His change of heart was dramatic, convincing, and moving. Our friend was a minister's son. He attended church school where he became rebellious at what he thought an overdose of religious education. For years thereafter, he was dogged by trouble and frustration. Business failure, insanity, fatal illness, suicide. These calamities in his immediate family embittered and depressed him. Post-war disillusionment, ever more serious alcoholism, impending mental and physical collapse brought him to the point of self-destruction. One night, when confined in a hospital, he was approached by an alcoholic who had known a spiritual experience. Our friend's gorge rose as he bitterly cried out, If there is a God, he certainly hasn't done anything for me. But later, alone in his room, he asked himself this question. Is it possible that all the religious people I have known are wrong? While pondering the answer, he felt as though he lived in hell. Then, like a thunderbolt, a great thought came. It crowded out all else. Who are you to say there is no God? This man recounts that he tumbled out of bed to his knees. In a few seconds, he was overwhelmed by a conviction of the presence of God. It poured over and through him with the certainty and majesty of a great tide at flood. The barriers he had built through the years were swept away. He stood in the presence of infinite power and love. He had stepped from bridge to shore. For the first time, he lived in conscious companionship with his creator. Thus, our friend's cornerstone was fixed in place. No later vicissitude has shaken it. His alcoholic problem was taken away. That night, years ago, it disappeared. Save for a few brief moments of temptation, the thought of drink has never occurred. And at such times, a great revulsion has risen up in him. Seemingly, he could not drink even if he would. God had restored his sanity. What is this but a miracle of healing? Yet its elements are simple. Circumstances made him willing to believe. He humbly offered himself to his maker. Then he knew. Even so has God restored us to our right minds. To this man, the revelation was sudden. Some of us grow into it more slowly. But he has come to all who have honestly sought him. When we drew near to him, he disclosed himself to us. So I believe this is the story of Fitz Mayo. Bev, is that correct? I think Bev knows. That's Fitz Mayo? The minister's son? I think so, yeah. Um, so in, in here in his story, you hear he grew up with religion. I grew up with religion. I was in the church choir. I went to church school, all the nine yards. But I, like this gentleman, said, that's too much. I don't like what you're selling me. Off I went. And I had a disagreement with God because I thought he was the root of all my problems. This guy had fatal uh, or fatal illness, suicide, insanity, business failure. I got all that in my story too. Um, but it wasn't God's fault. So, but what happened to him is he got to a point alone in his room and he says to himself, who am I to believe there is no God? And he became willing. He became open-minded and he honestly tried. And the minute he opened his mind to it, 
God showed up. Now I'm going to tell you for myself, the minute I actually opened my mind up to this, God showed up. When my husband died and I did the set of steps this way that I show you guys, I was like, yeah, I'm all in. And I'm not kidding you, the spiritual experiences I've had since then have been insane. There's like more stories that I don't, like, you'll hear them if you stick around. They always come out. But he showed up. Before that, I was of the educational variety. Why? I wasn't fully willing. I wasn't fully open-minded. So for those of you who think you are of the educational variety, I ask you this. Were you fully willing, fully open-minded when you were having that slow progression to God? Probably not. For myself, two years I was here and I was like, yeah, I'm willing to believe in something, but I'm not going to do that. And then I'm not going to do this. And I was only half-ass in it. And I got a half-ass higher power. The minute, the minute I said, I'm doing this, give it to me. He showed up. Loud and in charge. Hey, God, I'm here. Hi. I'm like, oh, wow. Hi. Okay. You're in charge. Okay, do it. And he did. Right? Like, my life turned around from that point. My The peace in my my head, the chaos is gone. Like I wake up in the morning, and there's nothing going through my head. There's no, I got to do this. I got to do that. It's just like, I wake up in the morning and I look out my window and I'm like, oh, it's raining today. And then I see my little bill plant, I do my morning routine, and I start my day. The chaos is gone from my life. Even when problems pop up, the chaos is gone from my life. There's simple manners to handle things now. He has come to all who have honestly sought him. He does not make hard terms at this. You go seeking him, he shows up. And he lets you know he's there. He loves to show you he's there. Why? Because he wants you to show other people. He wants you to, to praise his glory, as they say in church, right? He shows up so we can show others. As we drew near to him, he disclosed himself to us. It's not, hey, come on over. We got to draw near to him. What am I doing to get closer to him? How am I trying to get this relationship developed? It's not like, yeah, can you come over, God? I got some shit I needed to deal with. He's like, yeah, no, I'm, I shouldn't have bought a truck. I'm not moving you this weekend, right? No, what am I doing to get closer to him? What am I doing to enhance this relationship? He shows up the more I do, right? The more I invite him in, the crazier the blessings get. All right. Anybody? Beverly. Hi, everyone. Beverly Alcoholic. I, I'm i so, I'm so touched by your conversion experience. I, I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> I'm a little envious. I think that would be great. Um, you know, I, I practice steps 10 and 11. And I think that's really, that's really key. But yeah, I, first of all, I had to remove the blocks that keep me from any kind of conscious contact because I, you know, I, I had plenty of blockage between me and any idea of a higher power. But I think, um, I think what's really key is what it says here on page 55, and here's what I had a problem with. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. I think for a long time, and probably even today, I'm still a little bit afraid of the actual power of God. I'm afraid that somehow it, it will be all consuming and somehow I will lose myself. You know, I think that's the part of the ego that, that wants to hang on to that identity or, or something. So, you know, I... I really relate this to, you know, on page 86, what the proper attitude is for anybody who's struggling like me um, and is, a, you know, in prayer and meditation. It's just, you know, the proper attitude is to, to really be quiet and just, you know, walk through that fearlessly. I, I think that's key. I think that's what I need to do. 
Mm-hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Bab. And, and, you know, for me, my experience is, you know, I always revert back to that page 14 and 15 and that utter confidence that our book promises us. And, you know, to say I found myself by letting go, whereas had I hung on, I probably would have held on to some parts of me that never would have allowed me to blossom into the person I am today. And it was that, like, holding on to that little bit that you might get all consumed in it. I can just tell from my experience, letting that go, and I found the truest form of myself. And I got that peace and that serenity and that utter confidence that our book promises us when we when we let go and let God take over. Um you know, there, it's, it's this unshakable. It's just like there's, I, it's like this Teflon coat that God's given me, where it's like I, I, I can't think of a problem that would take me down right now. Uh, Marianne Toronto, good morning. Hi, friends. I am an alcoholic from Toronto. My name's Marianne. Grateful to be here. Grateful to be sober. Thank you for all your sharing. It, it really is authentic and and touching today. Kim, it really is touching my heart. I know for me, what I had to do after I did that step three was I had to try these things. I had to go to that big book study, even when my head was screaming, no, no, no. And it was loud. And then as I started practicing the steps and the inventory and and all of the steps and realized that I, I, I looked forward to to going to this big book study. I look forward to these meetings. I get enjoyment out of it. And that's how God is showing up for me. It's just filling up a real big hole in me. But I really had to just say, and I was pretty desperate, so I had to do this and and just shut this up, talk to people that knew that this would work for me, and then just keep going through and pushing through. And that's why I, and, and, and then I realized that's how God shows me. It's just like, oh, wow, this really worked. So I, I can't tell people so much because I, I, I help, try to help people. And I, you know, that they say, oh, I can't go to a big book study or I can't do that. And they, and I can just hear the noise that I used to have when I talk to other people. And it's just like, just try it. Just whatever your head says, just try it. And I keep, and I keep telling myself that too when I get twisted up. What is the prayer that, you know, the big book has told me to do? Get out there and do that prayer. Do that meditation. It's, it was the same thing with meditation. My head would say, oh, you can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that until I tried it. And then I said, wow, I can do this. But it's just sometimes that head is just so loud. So thank you for sharing because it's it's people like you that share and, and, and share authentically and, and really from the heart that says, oh, maybe it'll work for me, and it shuts this up enough enough of a moment that I'll, I'll give it a try. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and someone just told me, you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And I made that my motto. Like, literally, it was ridiculous. I was like, got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. It's fine. Just do it. And it worked. It worked. Jan in Ohio. Hi, Kim. I really appreciate the studies. I'm Jan. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I have a question. I was going to save it for my sponsor, but um, I wrote it down. How do I know I have honestly sought him, and even on a daily basis? How do I know this? Is he showing up for you? I don't know. I, I'm... I'm I pray in the morning, I pray in the afternoon, I pray in the evening. Um, I'm not just asking, asking, asking all the time. I'm trying to turn my will over to him. I mean, there's no bright light coming out of the sky or anything. But just, how do I know? Where, are you feeling that uh, or that uh, in your stomach? Like a warm feeling? Well, no. Like when you're making or, choices and decisions, are you going, okay. that was easy? Or are you going, oh, I don't know. This doesn't feel good. I'm not sure what to do. If you're in that and you've got that angst, 
where you're feeling mm -hmm. like, I don't know what to do, that's your will. If, if you that's just kind will. of have the right thought and you just trust it, that's God's will. Okay, like when I feel very serene about things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then you'll notice little things start to happen. Like God shows up and you'll notice, like we call them God shots, coincidences. Like the yeah. coincidences I've had, it's God. And they get louder and louder the more you pay attention to them. So how do I keep outside influences from getting in the way? What, you know, what type of influences? Keeping me on the journey. What type of influences? Um, less. <laughs> um, I can't really Page find the seventy. Name, but, um, pardon me. Page seventy. Okay. To Thank calm you. the imperilous urge, work with others when to yield would mean heartache. My former sponsor said that, that to me 25,000 times. And I'm telling you right now, here's how it works. You do the meditation, and we're going to get to it, but whatever. I'm, you asked a question, I'm going to say it because someone needs to hear the answer. So we do the meditation and the prayer with God on what our ideal relationship is. Not what our our Santa wish list is for a partner or a relationship, but what we really think God wants for us. And we write it down. And then we ask ourselves, am I all of these things? Usually we are not. Usually what we do is we try to date people to complete us because that's what we do. Oh, God, my son's calling from school. Oh. Um, <laughs> so what we do is we do our ideal meditation on what our ideal relationship looks like. Then we work with others. Work with others, work with others, work with others. If anything comes up in your life, work with others. Why? That's where we grow. So when we grow, we become our ideal God person. And then the ideal partner comes into our lives and we explore it. If I'm on dating sites, I'm, I'm in my will. I want a boyfriend, I want a boyfriend, or I'm sick and I'm bored in bed. Um, but if I'm in God's will, it will just happen naturally. Okay. Right? Yeah, if, mine's more like a financial issue, but... Yeah, so finances is the same thing, right? Okay. If you can sit in meditation, what does my ideal financial situation look for for God? You can apply it to business and professional as well. So, and you Thank just you. kind of listen for guidance from outside your brain. And the number one thing, if you have chaos, write it down. Chaos written down, okay. it doesn't spin. Chaos is a tornado. So if you have a thought, it starts spinning around your head. And then other thoughts start spinning in there too. And then you've got this big Kansas-sized tornado in your head. When you write it down, it gets it out of your head. And it's on paper. And a lot of the time when you read it back to yourself, it sounds ridiculous. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very, So, but very when much. it's in your head, it's like ping, 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 and you can't focus. So just write it all down. And God will come through your pen. Invite him in. Mel, who I missed on Monday because I was Hello, sick. Yes, Melody, I'm not calling. <laughs> I wondered if you could share that story you've um, told us a few times of when you... Um, we're going down the road, you know, when you saw that lady crying, because I, I mean, it's just a really good example of, um, like that lady was just asking about, how do you know that God's speaking to you, or... Yep, it's thought, funny, because really that story came into my head, like, five minutes ago. <laughs> so God yells at me, um, God yells at me, so I was driving my daughter Summer to school, and I had to get gas. So I stopped at the gas station, and I'm a bit of a chatty Kathy, if you haven't noticed. And so I went in the gas station, and I know the lady that works there because I'm in a small town. And we were chit-chatting, and it was her birthday. So, of course, I'm like, oh, happy birthday. And, of course, Summer's like, Mom, I'm late for school. That was God slowing me down, right? So we get up to the front of the school, and um, Summer's going to get out of the car. And I'm like, bye, have a great day. And a lady comes out of the school, and she's crying. I'm going to cry, Mel. And the, the 
my my head immediately sees her and I'm like oh she's crying oh I should see if she's okay and Summer's like oh that's so-and-so's mom I wonder why she's crying so I was like now Summer's made it personal she knows the child so Summer gets out goes in the car and I start driving and I can see this lady crying on the sidewalk and the voice in the back of my head says you should see if she's okay and I'm like no 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 I don't have time for this today I'm really busy I gotta go I'm running late I gotta go so I turn the corner and she's walking on the sidewalk and I can see her out of the corner of my eye. And I'm like, the voice in my head got a little louder. You should see if she's okay. I'm like, not today. I'm busy. So at this point, I'm arguing with God. This is how it works for me. I get to the end of the street and the voice is louder. Like I'm visibly, like I'm driving slowly. I'm not foot on the pedal because it's like I'm fighting with my head now. And so I get to the end of the block and I'm like, fuck, fuck, fuck. And I turn the corner and I look down the sidewalk and I'm like, yes, she's gone. I'm free. Corner of my eye, I see her sitting in her car sobbing. And the voice in my head is, you need to go see if she's okay. And I'm like, fuck. I, don't I pulled my car over. And I got out and it's raining. And the voice is like, you got to see if she's okay. And I'm like, I don't have time for this. I look like an idiot walking up to this lady in her car. Like I'm fighting with God in my head now. And I'm like... Knocked on her window and I'm like, hey, I said, I noticed you're crying. I'm Summer's mom. Um, I just, I wanted to make sure you're okay. And she broke down and she told me some stuff that was going on. We had a conversation and it was just like, I had to stop. The voice in my head was so loud. I couldn't have driven away with a clear conscience that day. And I walked back to my car and of course me, I'm hilarious. I'm like, are you happy now, God? And I got in my car and I called one, my, my step 10 buddy to let her know that I was arguing with God and what had happened. Because that's how my conscious contact with God is at this point. Something had to happen that day. I don't know if it was for me or if it was for her. I don't know if she was on her way to do something terrible. I don't know if had I driven up the hill, I would have been hit by a drunk driver. I don't know why I had to stop that day. All I know is God yelled at me so loud in my head to tell me to stop my car and see if that lady was okay. Even though me, Kim, is like, I'm late. I got to go. It's raining. She's going to think I'm crazy. I had to let that go. That was my will. God's will was go see if she's okay. Stop your car. And I did. Um. Will it disclose itself later at some point? I don't know. Do I care? No. All I know is I had to stop my car that day. What would have happened had I not stopped? I'll never know. But I know that I had to stop my car. So I listen to those voices in my head all the time. I listen to those cues. It can be as simple as when you think of someone you haven't seen for a while. Or if someone says, hey, have you heard from so-and-so in a while? Nope, but I reach out to them. If someone calls me and tells me someone's struggling, I don't care. I call that person. If it gets back to the other person, I don't care. Am I going to say so-and-so called and said you're struggling? No. Am I going to call and make something up? Hey, I, I, just, I was thinking about you. Are you okay? Yeah. Why? Because that's the voice that God's put in my head. I have to do that. Has it helped me? Absolutely. I almost went out on my one year. I was in my car driving to buy alcohol and someone thought to call me. God had my back. That's how we have a first defense against the first drink. It works like that. It says God works in mysterious ways. He works through us. It's not fucking mysterious. God works through us. So we need to listen to him when he asks us to do these things for him. Because he doesn't have unlimited calling from heaven. He's busy. So he sends you a quick text message to your brain and says, check on so-and-so because I something's up. That's how it works. So we need, to, we need to listen to those connections and not blot it out by us saying, I'm in a hurry. It's raining. She's going to think I'm crazy. I don't give a heck. It saved my ass and it saved me from going out and drinking. And I, who knows, I wouldn't be sitting here. And it saved me twice. So I know it works. 
And so when you hear those little voices in your head, please listen to them. That's how you know that God is close. That's how you draw him even closer. I'm hardwired. He just tells boss me around all day. And I'm like, you know, even when I don't want to reach out, I reach out because I listen to that voice. And that's how I've been able to get the amazing blessings I've got. It's, it's that two-way street. He says, Kim's a good soldier. I'm going to bless her. What do I got to do? I got to be a nice person. That's not so bad. That's not so bad. I might piss people off once in a while, but I can take that. You know what I mean? I can take it when someone is offended that I called someone because they let me know they were struggling. If it saves someone, I don't give a fuck if someone's mad at me. I never intentionally say so-and-so told me to call you. Yeah, the person might figure it out if that was the only person that knew. I'm fine with that. My shoulders can bear that weight. Why? Because they're backed by God. There's lots of there's lots of wiggle room on these shoulders for someone to be mad at me for helping another person. I am always going to reach out. I can take that, right? It's all right. Add it to their floor. They'll get over it. All right. Thanks, Mal. Anybody else? Ooh, we're 1203. Good. We can, I'm sticking around for questions, so let's close with the serenity prayer.